Once again, all of us at the Dub Network would like to thank Herman Marshall Whiskey for being such a great partner. They, like us, are based here in Dallas County, and in fact, they were the very first distillery in the county since Prohibition times. Herman Marshall produces handcrafted, award-winning small-batch whiskey, all aged in new white oak barrels. This includes their Texas bourbon, Texas rye, Texas single malt, and blended bourbon whiskey. All of their whiskeys are built from the grain up, just like good whiskey should be. We're excited to see their brand new distillery in Wiley, Texas when it opens this spring. It will have an outdoor stage perfect for concerts, parties, and events, and of course, a podcast or two. Thanks again, Herman Marshall Whiskey. Welcome to another episode of Suds with Luds. Uh, today, we're getting younger. We, we've had a lot of guys here from the past. <laughs> I don't know and, about that. Uh, uh, we're going to get younger today. Today, uh, we welcome in Vern Fiddler, uh, Dallas Star, Preds, uh, who else? New Jersey a little bit. Um, half, a, half a year in New Jersey and then two years in Phoenix. 800 and just shy of 900 games in your career. Um, anyway, welcome. Fizz, thanks for being here. I got, I got a whole shitload of things I'd love to talk to you about. Um, you know, I, I want to start with current events. So we were just talking um, just here a few days ago. The Dallas Stars had their first uh, couple inductees into the what they have as a, the Hall of Fame now. Bob Gainey and Darian Hatcher, obviously appropriate. Bob Gainey, who was the architect of at least the era that I played in, of putting that group together and, and winning the cup here in Dallas and, and Hatch for being the captain, the first one that, first American that was able to lift the Stanley Cup and just a, a monster as far as I was concerned when he played. And I know you played against Hatch, you never got a chance to play with him. And he probably didn't play much against him. A couple, do you remember anything about him playing against him? Uh, well, yeah, a little bit. Like I, I, I'm growing up in Edmonton, your guys' massive rivalry with, um, yeah. you know, with the Oilers and, you know, just, I remember him being just such a massive presence on the, on the blue line. And, you know, he just was one of those really calm, collected guys that when the game, when the game got hairy, he, he wasn't backing down. He was dragging his team into the fight and, uh, I always had a lot of respect for him. So, uh, you know, just from the, from the, uh, you know, watching the Oilers in the playoffs and, you know, your guys' big rival that you had a few years there, um, you know, and then got getting a chance to play against him. Uh, I, I just remember looking at him and being like, man, I, I knew he was big, but I didn't realize it, he was that big. Yeah. Um, but, you know, what a, what a great guy. I've got to know him over the last couple of years just with the alumni events and, such a humble guy quiet and you know when he, when he talks you know he you know when he talks you you know everyone really listens and you know there's the speeches the other night there at gillies is and the, the hall of fame uh the uh, banquet there it it just showed uh what, what respect he had from his teammates and um it's not hard to tell when a guy has, has respect from his teammates when you know he gets a uh, great showing there at the hall of fame dinner and uh, it was a, it was a fun fun night to be a part of was there anybody in your career that played similar to Hatch that when you played again? I mean, you played almost 900 games, and was there anybody that came along like like Hatch? I mean, it was because you were you were in that era where we're starting to transition, right? It's not what it was today, but it was getting closer to more of that style of game. Would you say? Or yeah, I, I, I mean, I played with a few guys. I mean, obviously, I think that that was a little bit of a, of the transition where it started to become a little bit more, um, you know, of a you know, a smaller, smaller man's game. Yeah. Um, but, you know, one guy that he really kind of reminds me, his personality reminds me a lot of is Kimo Tiemann. And, uh, and I know there's not a huge comparison as far as right. playing, but as far as he, uh, leading, Kimo Tiemann didn't always say a whole bunch. He just led on the ice. And when he did, when he did talk, there was, there was a lot of ears listening and uh, just commanded respect just, just on his personality and, the way he played the game right and you know while we showed up for his teammates and just a solid teammate so uh personality wise i would probably say chemo team and i was going to save this for a little bit later but since we're on the captains and leaders and you talk about being a quiet leader they they, they led the way that they played is the way i looked at hatch I, I looked at hatch that he had this ability to to sense the tone of the game and when it, something needs to be changed he didn't as a matter of fact he didn't even want him saying anything because he was like a caveman at times you know um <clears throat> but it, it was it was impactful when he 
flip the switch. And I think of a couple guys that you did play with in Brendan Morrow and Jamie Benn. And would you kind of put them in that quiet leadership kind of guys? And because I looked at Brendan, you know, I've always said that I thought Brendan cut his own career short by the way that he played. He didn't have the size of Darian, but he played the same way and he didn't back down from anybody. Jamie, I don't know if Jamie gets enough credit for as tough as he actually is. But, and, you know, Jamie was there the other night at the, the Hall of Fame thing and had a chance to talk to him a little bit. But where do you put those two as, as captains? And you, you've played with some good captains yeah, in your career. I, I would put them up there. They're, you know, they're, they're definitely comparable to, um, you know, Brandon was another guy that I, you know, Western League guy. Um, you know, we have some, some, some families that are, um, you know, close uh, that we kind of knew each other, but we didn't know each other until I came here and, and signed with the Stars. But, you know, Brendan was also one of those guys that, you know, he didn't ever say a whole bunch, but, you know, he could barely tie his skates when I was playing with him here. Heat packs on his back, never bitch and complain one day, you know, just get out there and then just play his ass off and, mm -hmm. and lead us, you know, like I talk about dragging guys into the fight and, you know, trying to rally the guys to get going hard, play hard, but he wouldn't do that vocally. He'd do that through his play. And, you know, it's, 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 it's a, I don't think it's a coincidence that, you know, these guys are all kind of like bred from this, you know, they, they've all been kind of, you know, p passed the torch down and what know, the organization kind of believes a captain yeah, should and, be. And then like with, with Hatch and then it goes tomorrow being the captain and then, you know, Morrow had Jamie under his wing yeah. and, and, you know, really taught Jamie the ropes. Like I've been having dinners and, you know, having young Jamie around and, you know, just giggling and, you know, laughing. But when it came time to play game, like, you know, those guys were two guys that mm -hmm. if I was going to, to bat for a championship or, you know, a big game, those are two guys that they'd definitely be on my list and including Hatch. Yeah. Uh, you'd probably be yeah. on that list oh, yeah. too. <laughs> those big shin pads, those will they'll take away some shot lanes. But, you know, though, the, with Jamie, uh, I was there. I was, you know, one of the assistant captains with Jamie and, you know, we always took care of the vocal stuff in the room and the rah-rah bullshit and, and Jamie would just make sure that we had that taken care of. He didn't want to deal with that. Mm -hmm. He wanted to go out. Mm -hmm. He could take the play to a different level on the ice that I couldn't do, but I could help out, you know, by playing the right way and, and getting the, the, the boys to, you know, get them rallied a little bit in the dressing room or if someone needed to be, you know, hadn't, hadn't needed a talking to in the right. dressing room. That's something we did. Jamie didn't want to do that. He wanted to lead on the way, and I think that lot comes from Brendan. He was the same way. Brendan didn't want to you know, I, I get in any confrontation with the guys. He just wanted to lead on the, my, on the ice. And I remember even Stefan Robida, he was one of the guys in the dressing room that would handle a lot of the off-ice stuff if someone got in shit or, you mm -hmm. know, um, Roby would always have a, have a chat with those guys. And then Brendan would get us on the ice and drag us into the fight, which, you know, it's kind of fitting. As, you know, you got these hatchers and you got Morrow and then now you got Jamie Ben. Yeah. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see who they chat. They, they uh, who the next one is pass the torch on to. <laughs> yeah, because th those guys, I don't see too many of them coming along. Not just in this organization, but oh, it's just in general. It's right? a dying breed. I mean, yeah. you you look at these teams. Like we went up and lived in Canada for for two years um, in in Kelowna, and you look at the, and then you come back to the U.S. and you, like the, the the amount of skill level that there is. Nobody wants, who wants to block shots and yeah. who wants to go hammer a guy and fight? No one wants to do that. Everybody wants to be a goal scorer. And, yeah. you know, a lot of these kids figure out that the, probably the hardest position in hockey is to be a goal scorer. And you don't realize, and I, I certainly didn't realize until I got to the NHL that, you know, you can score in the minors, you can score at junior level. But when you get to the NHL, yeah. There's one percent of these guys with the high amount of skill that can cont continually, consistently do it every night, and you know you can hold hold your own for a couple of weeks, but to do it consistently for a full career, it's like one percent. Like it's yeah. it's high high end talent. So a lot of these guys, I know I figured it out a little bit later that I couldn't be a skilled guy. I just didn't. I I you know I, I had to find another way to to, to stay around by playing a little bit harder and playing, you know, blocking shots. And You're walking me through my whole sheet right now. Let, I can't even ask the question. You, can, you can start talking. <clears throat> no, you, you because do, this was... I'm, I'm rambling. No, I want you to <laughs> ramble because it's exactly where I wanted to go. And we both help out with the young kids now, right? Your, yeah. your son, who we'll talk about a little bit later, 
playing on the U16s here with the Dallas program, and I've got the U18, 17s, and 18s along with Addy. But you mentioned the Western League. Um, you mentioned Brendan Morrill. You mentioned Kelowna. Three fucking things I got on my list, and you, you touched on them, and I'm <laughs> glad you did. Um, let's go back to your junior days. Like when you were, you played, you played three years in Kelowna, I think, and then. And, and answer the question why you only played three games at last year. And was it this uh, Memorial Cup thing that you got traded? You got traded later, right? But talk about Kelowna and then that stuff there. Yeah, so um, I was actually, uh, I had gone to Kelowna's uh, rookie camp in Strathmore, Alberta, f of two years at 15 and 16. And uh, at my 16 year, I almost, you know, I almost had made the team and um, they just said, you know, you're just not big enough right now. And, you know, this is a big boy league. You need to go back and play mm -hmm. a, a midget and ended up going back and playing midget AAA in Edmonton and, you know, having a really good year. And we ended up going all the way to the finals and almost made it to the Pure Later Cup. And uh, at the end of the year, uh, my mom took me down to Humboldt of all places and she said uh, they were really interested and, in, you know, the coach brought me down and how far were you from Humboldt we we're about nine hours okay. so me and my mom drove down because that's where the tragedy happened here a few yeah, years sir, ago right yeah. okay uh, so we me and my mom drove down there and my mom my mom's from Saskatchewan so you know I didn't think I was going to be good enough to make Kelowna but um, you know I started to, to really develop my coach did, did a really good job I, th I thought my last year and went to Humboldt and I made the team but hum uh, SJHL camps were before Kelowna so I remember I remember this is like it was yesterday, my dad folding up a fifty dollar bill and you know giving it to me and said, you know, good luck and we'll. How be long did that have to yeah. last? Well, that's the that's the funny part is like when I got I took the bus there and I and this young gentleman asked me if I could buy him a coke. We stopped halfway in uh, Lloyd Minister and I I he's like, well, you got a fifty. I, I said, well, I'm not. I I I don't know. I don't know how long this needs to last me. So like I was saving yeah. every penny, right? But um. Ended up going to Humboldt, making the team starting school, and I already had committed to go to Kelowna for camp, but I figured that, you know, I'm 17 years old, they'll just send me back to Humboldt, and I'll just leave my stuff here. And so I got to I got to Kelowna, met my mom and dad there, and I remember my dad was, we, about three or four days in the camp, my dad, you could see him up there, he's like waving me over before we, we started, you know, that day, and I was skating around. He's like, there's an article in the paper about you. And he was all <laughs> fired up, right? And I, I was like, oh, I don't know. He's yeah. like, so after the game, uh, Peter Anholt, who coaches in, or general manager now in Lethbridge, he called me in and said, you need to get your transcripts. We're going to, we're going to, you know, you're going to start the season here. So I just walked on the camp. Like, I wasn't listed, nothing. Walked on, ended up making it, and, you know, had a had a decent year, held my own as a, as a rookie, and... A couple had a couple more years there, and you know I, I was just kind of like leveled off where you know it was it was time to you know be an overage and. Um, what kind of player when you were there? I I saw your your career things in junior. You played like 260 games, 265 or something, like 180 some points. Yeah. Was was that kind of what you were coming into juniors? Like, were you a goal scorer? Were yeah, you a point I was guy? more of like a. Uh, I was I was st I'm still somewhat of a two way. I was always good on faceoffs. I was like. Yeah, you know, pretty good hockey hockey sense and could play in my own end. But as I got a little bit stronger and a little bit better of a skater, um, I started to get more offensive. And then that that year, I went back at, at Bantam AAA. I think I led my team. And then I went back from Kelowna at 17, and you know, I I started to pop offensively. Started to get you know a little bit more mm -hmm. of an idea. Confidence wise, and yeah, everything. confidence yeah. and just you know, I started to get a little bit stronger. And I was get I was growing. I was tiny. I started to get, I think I got to like 5'9 in that midget year um, as a 16 year old. And then just started getting a little bit bigger and stronger. And um, I, I was playing in Kelowna and then they, we had four 20 year olds that year and they came in and asked me, they said, you know, we're thinking of trading you to, um, you know, closer to home. Would you be into that? And I said, yeah, I would be like, I, I thought I was going to go to U of A. Right. I really did. So I went to, I got traded to Medicine Hat, and I'll never forget it because I had the drive through Edmonton, stopped at home for turkey dinner my mom had made, <laughs> and made my way up to Med Hat. And, you know, it was really nice because it was four hours from our hometown. And my mom and dad, they, they knew that, would, they thought that was going to be my last year. So mm -hmm. they, um, they they were at every game. They were, you know, my first How game. How far was that from home? Four hours. So okay. I, I would, I would. You know, my first game, I'll never forget it. I, I got my first shift I scored, 
and I just knew it was a good feel. It was a good fit for me. The coach had tons of confidence. I loved the, you know, I loved being in Alberta and ended up, I think I almost had 40 goals that year. And, and 33, uh, I think. Yeah, it was, yeah. it was a good year. And then I got, and then I got uh, called up to, um, I got called up at the end of the year to Rivers, uh, the Arkansas River Blades. Yep. And um, that summer, I was just training. It was early. Now, was that the East Coast or what? It was oh. East Coast Hockey okay. League. Yep. I, I was, uh, I was just training back, and I went back to Kelowna after that year. Had a good year, and uh, I, I, I got a call from Minnesota. Rich Sutter, he said, "We want you to come to camp." Mm -hmm. I said, "Perfect, I'll come to camp." And um, ended up, they ended up, you know, I, I, I actually ended up playing an exhibition game as a, just a free agent yeah. and they really liked me and you know, I had a pretty good camp and they wanted to send me to their East coast team, but I already had my rights owned by this other team and they had traded me to Roanoke. Yeah. <laughs> so of all places I get, uh, I get sent down uh, and I was going to go back to U of A after I got cut from Minnesota, I was going to go down to go back and go to U of A and. So you uh, wanted to go to school? Yeah, I wanted yeah. to go to school. Yeah. And what, what did you want to do in school? Did you have any, Anything you were going for? I was just going to do like... Was it realty? No, no I was going to do... that's what you're doing now, yeah, but okay. Yeah, I was so going to do that. business, like just, yeah. you know, I'm play for Rob Dom and, and okay. you know, just kind of, you know, play a little bit more hockey and um, ended up, my mom and dad talked me in they said, you know, you should, you should, you, you're start, you're a little bit of a late bloomer, you know, my dad and, you know, your mom and dad believe in you more than anyone, right? And I said, well, I'll go down the Roanoke and I'll give it till Christmas. And... Um, I I remember I was walking in the mall at in November. My mom and dad were down there visiting, and my uh, Chrissy, my wife, uh, she she was my girlfriend at the time. She was um, she was phoning the mall. We had went to the mall, and she was phoning the mall because we didn't have cell phones yet. And I, I my mom my mom said, "Did I just hear your name getting paged through the intercom?" Yeah. I go, "No." Again, Vernon Fiddler, if you're in this mall, come to the information center. It's my wife. She's like. You got to get home and pack. You just got called up to the American Hockey League. Oh wow! So, you know that's where it started, and all in in all of this East Coast. So then uh, that gave me a little bit of more hope. And uh, my mom and dad were like, "Oh, you know, you, you're in the second best league now. You just got to keep grinding yeah. and grinding." It ended up finishing out that year, and and got a entry level with Nashville that summer. Yeah, you you talk about grinding, and I and the word that I use, and I did this with Eddie. I, you you weren't drafted, right? No. You're undrafted, so. Yeah. Eddie Belfour was undrafted. Now Eddie went on. He's a Hall of Famer and all this other stuff. He's got his own whiskey bourbon company after his career. Um, <clears throat> and he kind of started in the AJ, I think, is where it was. And mm -hmm. he kind of went from here to here to here. And then you spent, what, four, five, six years minor-wise or kind of back and forth? Would that be is that about right? Yeah, I think I had, like, my first year I was in the minors for between the East Coast and the AHL. Yeah. And then um, the second year... Uh, which when I was under contract with Nashville, they I, I had gone I went up about I probably played 19 games that year, so I played 19. They wouldn't give me my 20 game bonus, so they yeah. kept more of yeah, one of them things, down. yeah. <laughs> and then the next year I played uh, 17 games, and then got. But then sent, you got called up, right? I got sent back. Okay. And then oh, you're that, talking about in Nashville, yeah. Yeah, and then yeah, there yeah. was a lockout year. Yeah. The following year, the. The, we won the, the Calder Cup that one year too, my first year pro, with well, well my second year pro with Milwaukee, um, and then that that second year with Nashville was a lockout, and then that net, the following year I was up, I played like three games in the minors. Yeah, um, uh, I got hurt in camp and went down for three games, and, and I, I, See, I haven't looked back. That, that's that's my that's what I was thinking is like with Eddie, I was going to say. The word I used for Eddie was perseverance, you know, because of all the things that he had to go through. You obviously had to go through more than that. And I think that's more of the norm than it is for these guys that just shoot right straight and go from, you know, they're 17 years old and 19 years old and they're playing in the NHL. But along the way, when because you mentioned it earlier about who you were, the player that you were, the type of player that you were. So did you have to change your game as you moved along, you think, like from juniors and then when you got to pro? Because you, to me, when I... I think of you as that guy that plays against top lines. You mentioned faceoffs before. I mean, you're a career 52, 53 in the faceoff circles, you know. And I don't know what what the highest is. I mean, I don't. Does anybody ever get to 60? No, not not, not in their anymore. career, right? <clears throat> so, 
Is that something that you worked on? Because if I know you have, and I know you're a good centerman, because you need to come out with our U18 team and teach them <laughs> how to take faceoffs. But but is that? Did you have to adapt your game? Like because you, you said earlier in your junior things, you were starting to score goals, your confidence stuff like that. But then you start to figure out what's going to keep you there, which is where we have the hardest time with some kids getting them to try to understand this is who. You, if you're going to go play in college, you're going to go to junior, whatever. This is how you're going to get. You're going to get there. It, like you said, one percent of the guys can score goals, and they all want to score goals. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. And I, I think I think my my biggest wake up call was when you sign an NHL contract. It doesn't matter who you are as a young kid. You know, twenty years old, you're like, oh, I'm I'm, I'm one made of the, it. I'm one of the I'm one of the best. Yeah. So that means I'm a goal scorer. Yeah. Right. Like it's just it's just automatic. Um, but I thought Ray Shiro and David Poyle and Barry Trotz, Brent Peterson, um, they did a really good job with me um, identifying what I needed to do to be a Nashville Predator. And I remember after my first year, uh, my first training camp, them, you know, having your exit meeting. And obviously I knew I was going down and they even told me, they said, like, there's going to be guys getting called up and down. Don't don't worry about them like mm -hmm. you're going down to develop like we think you could be our fourth line center for years or even maybe our third line center and they said but these are the things you need to do that you need to be a good face-off guy you need to be a penalty killer like you got to be one of the top penalty killers in the league did it bother you to hear fourth line center did, i mean you know in your own mind were you thinking i'm better than the fourth line center no or did you just i'm buying in because i no. just want to play in that it league? Made, yeah it made me a believer because i knew okay well if i can get to the fourth line then I can, then I'll, then I'll go from there. Like my goal was always like, I know I'm going to be a young guy, you know, but they, they laid it out. Like I remember even having my piece of paper going down to the, the minors in my little kit. And it, it said, you know, be a pest, be a penalty killer, be a reliable did guy. Did they write you that? We call them calling cards for yeah. a play. Is that what they, yeah. did they give that to you? Yeah, they, okay. uh, they, they had it all written out. And, and uh, Brent Peterson, who was, you know, like my, my second father, he always was on my side and, He'd give me shit more than anybody in the whole on the whole team, but he even in, when I was in the minors and they'd come down and watch, you know, he would get on me. But he, I knew he, did, I knew he was doing that because he cared so much. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, it was it, there was a couple wake up calls. Even I remember my even they told me don't you know this jersey you're not going to wear this jersey this year. You're going to go down there. We want you to be a good solid guy, point a game if you can. Like uh, obviously down there it's a little different. Um, good teammate, the blah blah blah, and I got called up like seven games in, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, well, and I had you know been scoring in the minors, playing a, you know a lot of minutes, and I got called up, and you know you play your few games, and now you're going to go down, you're been on a private jet and stuff, you're going down, <laughs> and well now all of a sudden I'm a goal scorer again, <laughs> yeah, right? So yeah. I remember having the conversation um, with my coach, and I remember him saying, listen, I know you, you, you scored a couple goals up in the NHL. You're coming down here, but we need But he, he gave you good advice then. Yeah, yeah. But, but I did get sat out one time because I was, you know, sniffing at the blue line and not back checking, and, and you know, you get a couple wake-up calls, but to answer your question, um, you know, you, you had to, and I knew that I could make a good living by, you know, blocking shots and being a hard guy yeah. to play against rather than... You know, I didn't get all the press and that, but man, it was worth it. To but you bought in. Changes. I mean, the whole yeah. thing was buying in. Absolutely. So, I, I know when I look at at my career, even when I was in school at North Dakota, Rick Wilson. I, I'm sure you know the name. I don't know if you ever, you, know, you never did anything with Wills, right? I mean, Wills but was on obviously a, know who he is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Wills was, you know, defense coach here for me in Dallas for a long time. But I had him as a coach. Same thing in in uh, North Dakota. But I've always felt along the way that. I played for the right coaches that had the right system, oh. right? I mean, that I was very fortunate that way. And it's like, and, and I think a lot of times GMs probably look at it that way. Like, this is how we play. This is what we believe in. That guy, We can plug that guy in there. So I look at the coaches that you had. Let, let's start. You mentioned Barry Trotz. Let's start with Trotzy. It actually still puts goosebumps uh, on, my, on my body with him. He um, just one of those guys that cared so much about us. And until you realized what how much he cared about you, like, you, you didn't. I, I even now looking back my first couple of years I was like this guy's hard on me but at the same time he'll call me in and ask me how I'm doing and how my mom and dad are and you know I remember when I he just called me in randomly and asked hey what's you know what's going on at the Fiddler house like mm -hmm. and I told him that you know we were having a baby boy and you know Prissy was three months pregnant he was like crying he was just really like, 
yeah, he was just so, uh, you know, so thrilled for us. And, you know, and then obviously business side takes over. And another little quick story I'll give you is um, he, I signed, ended up signing a two year with Phoenix. We, you know, we couldn't come to an agreement with, with Nashville. And I decided that I wanted to, you know, make some more money and, and, you know, go to, you know, try to even, you know, get higher in the lineup. And I just felt like my time in Nashville was done. And I remember the conversation I had stopped by the house and, you know, let's have a chat and just, you know, you came here a boy and you're leaving a man and how proud you are of him. And to this day, I still keep in touch with him. We, he didn't you know, try to talk you into staying? You no, know, we couldn't. I was already signed. I had oh. already got a little bit of a raise and I was happy with that. But, you know, and then not only that, like you talk about a guy to come into the league as a rookie and have a guy that doesn't care about pedigree, doesn't care what round you're drafted in. All he cared about was, you know, you're a good human, you work your ass off and uh, you do whatever he, he asks you to do. Mm -hmm. And I would do that. Like if Barry Trotz told me, you know what, let's get a laugh. Take your take your gear off and run across the arena in your underwear. I would do it. <laughs> yeah. I'm not kidding. Yeah. I'd do anything for yeah. that man because he gave me my opportunity when, you know, I had fallen through the cracks and didn't have, I didn't basically even have a place to play at U of A. I might have been the fourth line center there. Sure where he believed in me and and I remember him telling me that I think you could be our fourth line center and at you know even I remember telling my parents how would that conversation go and they're kind of looking at me like you know, yeah you know there was a little bit of questioning yeah but he believed in me and 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 you know, I don't know what what it was like whether I was just a, a good at systems or you know he just liked my work ethic my, my abilities and he really believed in me and I know he went to bat for me a lot like on the ice and you know, keeping me around, and you know, I remember the when he even told me to get a to get a place in Nashville. Like he was almost in tears because he knew the w amount of work I put in. Sure. And I don't know if I reminded him of himself or what, but um, just a great man, great coach, so loves coach, loves his players. How, how he always seems to be in control on the bench. You know, again, when you see him on TV and things like that, he doesn't lose his mind. He's not snapping. He doesn't snap. I mean, he ha occasionally, like they all do. Behind the scenes, is he different than what you see him on the bench? No, he's cool as a cu cucumber. He's constantly in control, very prepared. Like, I mean, we'd come in and a board, you know, the size of those curtains of just handwriting, like, our system and reminders. Yeah. And, and this isn't just every – this is, if it isn't every home game. This is all 82 games and then all a playoff. Details. Just detail, 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 detail. And I mean, there's nothing that misses out. And the, and the communication was amazing. You, hey, you got this line tonight, even against the fourth line, fourth line against third line, third yeah. line. This is who you got. This is who you need out outplay. Yeah. And I mean, at that time when I was playing in Nashville, we had, we had teams that were, were were spending three three mount three times the amount we were spending. Like we were a bargain yeah. team. Yeah. But yeah. he got the most out of every team. Like we'd scratch and claw and. You know, most of the years that I was there, we didn't find out we were making the playoffs till the last game of the year. You know, so like, you know, it was a, he was very demanding, but he was also a guy that was very fair and <clears throat> taught me a lot, not only off the ice, but on the ice. Life. Life yeah. guy, yeah. Are you surprised right now that he's taking his time to pick his team, where he's going to go? He's sitting out there, you know what I mean? Like, I just wonder because... He was doing a podcast. I, I did a thing with Cam and Strick, Cam Jansen and stuff. And, man, they got a bu bunch of bumps out of it because Barry had made a, a comment on there. He's interested in the original six teams and that he was, you know, might want to coach in Canada, you know. And all of a sudden, Toronto Maple Leafs are having a hard time. Like, is he that calculated, do you think? Or do you think he knows exactly the team that he wants to go to? No, I think I think he's just I think uh, he he's he's a real family first kind of guy, and I think that I think he wanted to take a year to spend some time with his family and figure mm -hmm. a few things out there, and you know, Trot, Trotsy's a guy that, that that will think everything through. He's not going to just coach to coach. Yeah. Um, you know, and, 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 and I mean, he's put himself in that situation where he deserves to go wherever he wants. Like he, he can go. Yeah. I know there's, oh, there's, sure. I know there's, there's teams that would fire their coach right now if he said he'd come coach for them. I agree. Right. Just because yeah. of his reputation. But yeah. I, if, if, if I think I know Trotsy, I think he's probably just 
taken a year to to you know help family out or i know mm -hmm. his mom and dad are get i think his mom may have passed but his dad is getting a little bit older and to spend a little bit of time i one of my friends coaches in the mjhl ran into him at the gas station so i know he's in manitoba oh yeah so i i if, if i know trotsy he's probably taking some time for his dad and yeah. his family and um you know that's probably the right thing to do because the minute he wants to coach again he'll have a job and you know and maybe you know he spent some time in the you know the smaller markets where maybe it is time for him to be on the 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 top of the pedestal but you know who knows i mean there's lots yeah, of there jobs a, that can come up. There were a up. lot of rumors about Winnipeg and stuff like that. Sometimes it's too close. Well, and if, if anywhere he's going to go, that's his that's his home province. So like, yeah. I don't know why he wouldn't if he does it, if he wants to be. You know, well, he's like, had that that Stanley Cup taste in his mouth. So I would think that yeah, you know, he can probably and he's in a position where he can probably pick the team that he wants to go. Yeah. So um, okay, and I and again, I'm going back to kind of I coaches that seem to have you know certain players in mind. Your next one, Dave Tippett. I, Tip was a, a teammate of mine in North Dakota. Very, you know, and Tip, the, man, he's got that deep voice. And But how do, how do you look at him as far as a coach? Uh, he was uh, He's definitely at the top of the list, too. I, I was lo so lucky to have him as a coach. Um, I think uh, the same thing. I reminded him uh, of, of him a bit. Yeah. We were. That's we, why I asked you about him. Yeah. Because that's he, who Tip was. He, uh, he always would say that, like, you know, we're cut from the same cloth, but... One thing I loved about Tip was just his his his, um, his game plan was always really thought through. Like he he always had something on the go, and he always had he was always one step ahead. And I felt like our team in Phoenix when I went there as a free agent, he wasn't even our coach yet. It was still Wayne when I signed, and then Wayne was like, oh, "I'm not doing this anymore." And we went into camp with uh, Al Samuelson as the yeah. intern, and then Tip came out of nowhere and. You know, he he was I I was I was super impressed. Just his um, his mm. his uh, he was at my house at the end of the star season when he was here, and because Tip is really into motorcycles, he built yeah, yeah. his own motorcycle and stuff. So he came over to my house. We were sitting by the pool, had a few beers, and he said, oh, "I'll give you a call tomorrow." Over the wire came Dave Tippett fired. Yeah. <laughs> and so that was the last last time I <clears throat> I actually saw Tip was then. But but he was always a detailed guy. Yeah, you know, and was, I figured he'd be he, one of your guys too. Yeah, he was. Uh, I, I loved it just because, you know, he he, he wasn't looking to, to win a game. And, and again, another coach that I, it couldn't have happened better because he was more of a defensive coach. Mm -hmm. Where like the offensive guys, I remember uh, Ray Whitney and Belongy and be like, oh, we, you know, they're, they're like, holy man, you must be tired. And I'd be like, yeah, I am actually. And they're like, well, fuck, you, can't, you haven't come off the ice. <laughs> They'd be calling me Tim, Tim yeah. Jr. Yes. Because they're like, well, your dad's fucking yeah. coaching the team. Like, and, you know, I'd be like, well, what do you want me to do? Like, yeah. we, But we'd get up a goal and we'd go and shut down mode. Like he knew that, that we didn't have a team that was going to score, you know. Four exactly. or five goals a game, but which they uh, haven't changed much. Yeah, even lo lo I love this communication. It's super honest. Like I remember a couple games, we'd get you know a couple minuses adding up, and he'd pull you in and lean against the office, wouldn't look, or the back of his, his back would be against the wall, and he wouldn't look at you. He'd be like, "Hey, we got to clean this up." You got you know, but just let us know. Yeah, you know, like instead of just not like sometimes you're you're so focused on other things that you know he was just super honest and you know. Loved the way I played, and you know he he was he always had our team, you know playing the right way. And if we didn't, he didn't like it, and he let us know. And uh, but I, I one thing I loved about Tip was he wouldn't wait until the bad thing happened. He'd be one step ahead and change it. Right. So he yeah. knew that that was probably going to come, and he would just be aggressive and go change it. And have you know most of the time that would that would you know help us in a way to win the game. It wasn't where well let's just wait it out and see if that burns yeah. us. Um, that's what I loved about Tip, and you know, really super smart coach on the bench. Like we could, you know, he'd he'd win us games. Like we didn't have a whole bunch in in the desert yeah. there, and you know, we got a couple pieces at the end. But um, just a you know, good chess player on the bench, and lo loved his mannerism. He, he's you know, just very calm, cool, collective, and yeah. When he got hot, he got hot. Yeah, exactly. But, <laughs> he could lose his marbles. Uh, I, I really much. enjoyed my time with him. Well. Then, then I, I think now your your identity and a big word we throw around, you know, with teams and things. Your identity is out there, right? So they know who you are. So now Dallas brings you in here, which is the reason you're here now. Um, and I think you started with Gully. Did you have Glenn Gullick in I your did, yeah. first year? How, yeah. how, now Gully was just getting started too. Yeah. Like I think he. Did, were you here the first year he got 
yeah. that he took over? Yeah. How was that year? Yeah. Yeah, it was good. Uh, you know, it was obviously a little bit of a, you know. Well, it's different coming off the other two coaches that you Yeah, had. so like yeah. I'm coming from Barry Trotz and then yeah. Dave Tippett and then we got a rookie coach. But, um, you know, he was part of the process of all the free agent stuff. When I started talking to Joe about, um, you know, possibly coming here, um, you know, he, he was friends with my agent. Uh, so that, you know, that was kind of the, the, you know, the line of conversation we were having before, you know, we were allowed to talk a couple of days before, but, you know, we, we started talking a little bit and, you know, I, I, I thought he kind of sounded like both of those guys, just a younger version, just mm -hmm. needed to be like helped a little bit. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, I thought he did a pretty good job. You know, it's, it's, it's like, these veteran guys, though, like we had Yager at one point, we had Ribeiro, we had these guys. They, they sniffed it. They sniffed it's, these poor young coaches tough, out, yeah. right? And and, yeah. and you know, I'm, I I don't care who my coach is. I'm going to do whatever the coach tells me to do. Mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to be going back and talking shop and the, you know, this guy doesn't know. I I really believed in him. I thought he had a lot of good uh, systems. I think that you know it was just we we were just an average team. Yeah. I think that you know different team he might have you know lasted a little bit longer but um i thought he had a lot of guns on him at the time and you know he didn't get a whole bunch of help mm -hmm. um but you know the way things work out he's had a good career and he's yeah. been in the nhl ever since whether right. it's in the head coaching position or a, an assistant coach position but again another great human knows the game really well um i think that you know, he could have had a little bit more help with yeah, yeah. You know, that, all the that starts from upstairs. going around and it starts yeah. upstairs, right? So does it change then when Lindy Ruff comes in? Did the did the game and the system and a little more up-tempo kind of things change when Lindy was there? Yeah, big time. Like he had a good, you know, obviously he had a track record of taking teams to the Stanley Cup Finals and he'd been around for a long time. Massive presence, yeah. right? Like really big personality and... Uh, really enjoyed him too. Like every day we came to the rink, win or lose, it was fun. You know, game, game. Uh, his game talks were great. He, you come in the day after a losing and a quick little chat gets you back on, you know, back on the road. And um, but one of one of the funnest coaches I've played for, as far as like just laughing and laughing and laughing. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we had some good teams. First, you could tell he was a player, right? Yeah, first yeah. coach that I had that you know our fourth lines were scoring like we had like me and Nystrom and Dvorak. We they, those guys had twenty goals and yeah. Nystrom had twenty. Like we we were we could go. Yeah. Then he was like, just because you guys are our fourth line, like I want you guys to go, you know. But um, he was he, that's the kind of coach he was. He was yeah. go. He even there were some things that he was coaching defensemen how to play one on ones and two on ones, and I was at practice a couple of times, and he had heard about it, and that I was like, "What are they doing now?" And James Patrick was here, right? Yeah. And so I had Jeep as a partner in, in North Dakota, and I had, uh, underneath I said, "What the fuck are you guys doing here?" Yeah. I don't know. That's what Lindy was, yeah. and they've been together forever, yeah. you know. <clears throat> so well, and I know Lindy like he likes the up tempo, and I think he's in a good spot now in Jersey, like yeah. with the way that they're going, that young stuff. I, I actually use some of their their highlights, um, the way that they play in their own zone. I used it the other day with our U18 guys yeah. because I like the way that they numbers and they're all moving out. You know, yeah. I like that because I think that's kind of the new generation. That's where you got to get them to go. So, so you end up. Well, then then you go to was it Jersey next? Just for a cup of coffee? Yeah, yeah. I, got, I, I wasn't gonna play, and uh, we were actually in. I think we were in on vacation in Kelowna or somewhere, and. You know, Ray Shiro phoned me out of nowhere to go to... Uh, Were you going to retire before that? I was going to retire. Yeah. I was actually going to go work with the Stars. They told me, they said, when you're done playing, just phone yeah. us, we'll give you a job. And I was just back home. I hadn't even started training yet, nothing. And uh, Ray Shiro phoned me. He's like, what are you going to do next year? I said, well, I'm not coming to New Jersey. So unless you're getting a new job, <laughs> he said, well, no, let's just chat like, let's like chat closer to the, you know, free agencies. Like I, I talked to Jim Nill and he said that, you know, you're potentially going to take a job and not yeah. going to play next year. But he's like, I think you can still play. So I, you know, we get a couple days before free agency. Did and, you think you could still play? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I thought I, I could still yeah. play. Like I had, you know, a good year the, the year before we, we went to the you know, playoffs and, uh, I knew I could play, but I just didn't. I didn't want to like leave my family here, right? Right. And I knew that they were getting roots, and I didn't want to pick them up. And I'm like, you know, New Jersey. And the biggest thing with Ray was he's like, you know, if if we're not a playoff team, which I don't think we will be, 
He goes, I'll move you. Okay. And I'll give you an opportunity. And he said, uh, so I don't know if you want to bring your family or not. He's like, but if you, if you don't, I'll fly you home on every off day. So I wouldn't, I wasn't basically even practicing. I was just there really? to like help out. And, yeah. you know, I was in, uh, I was, I was in the dressing room and stuff and off days. If we had three days, I was back in Dallas. No kidding. Yeah. So it, it was actually a pretty good setup. And then around like right after Christmas, I hurt my knee. I was out for like six weeks. And he called me about fifth fifth week. I was back here. He's like, "Hey, I got a couple of teams calling for you. You think you can play?" I'm like, "Well, I'm gonna, I'm starting to skate." So Lucas Reed yep. was skating me here at Valley yep. Ranch. Started getting the wheels going and training again and rehabbing. Flew into Philadelphia and played a couple periods. <laughs> <laughs> got through that and raised like, "Hey, you're, you're just you're not you're you know you're gonna just just go home." And he's like, "I think I got something. I I think I got you traded." And so I, of all places to go on when you're going to get traded, I went to Verizon and my phone wasn't working. Right. And I gave them my phone. They're like, oh, I'll be an hour. I said, okay, I'm going to go shop around. Uh, one hour turns into two hours. Two hour turns into three hours. And they call me in and have like a, a they have a Verizon counselor here. The guy that took my phone originally, like the mechanic. And they're like, we got good news and we got bad news. I go, and I'm in New Jersey. Yeah. I said, okay, well, give me the bad news first. Oh, we've lost all your contacts and pictures <laughs> off your phone. I'm like, okay, give me the good news. We're going to give you three months free on, on Verizon. <laughs> I go, I don't give a fuck. I go, how do I get my phone numbers back? Yeah. Oh, it, it, you got to go back and wherever your big computer is, like your iCloud, you got to. Yeah, you're supposed it. to back if it that's in, in back Dallas. It up, yeah. So I get my phone back and, I'll, and I mean, Luddy, it was like, ding, ding, ding. As soon as they turn it on and get me a new phone, they're like, ding, ding. And there's one number, like, it's like, where the hell are you? Call me ASAP, call me, call me, where are you? Missed call. So finally, I, I pressed on the text message. I said, so I lost all my contacts. Who is this? Ray, Ray Shiro. Oh, yeah. Called me right away. I go, what's up? He goes, I got you traded. I go, where? He goes, I, I think I got to deal with Nashville then. I was wondering, like, so you bookend your career by going back there. Yeah, I started. Were you jumping minute. with that? Oh, my God. I mean, well, I was done in, New, like, New Jersey was, like, we hadn't won a game in, like, six weeks. Yeah. I wasn't playing. I went back, played one game, played so bad, I don't even know why a team would want me. And, uh, yeah, David Poyle phoned me. He goes, hey, this isn't out yet, but he goes, I know you're hurt. I know you've been out. He goes, we'll get you back into shape. We need a good dressing room guy. You're not going to probably play every game. Like, you'll play one out of the two if we play back-to-back. -back. He's like, we, we need you to come in, and we think you can help us. I'm like, perfect. When do you want me there? He's like, uh -huh. can you come in the night? I said, well, I got to, you know, pack up and get my stuff. And sure. So I got a plane and, and got to Nashville. And I mean, it was, it was so, so surreal because I had started my career there seven yeah. years. And to go back there, like, I remember I met my wife at the, the um, airport. She flew in. I flew in. And we met at the airport, and, I, and I'm just like happier than a, I couldn't yeah. wait to get to that that locker room. And you know, we're driving in, we're like, oh my god, like that building wasn't there, and that building mm -hmm. wasn't there, and you know, that building wasn't there, and it was just surreal. To, and then, you know, the finish we had, we went all the way to the Cup final, and we were so close that, you know, it still makes me sick. But yeah. you know, to see that city rally around that team with. We had 300,000 people outside the rink. Is that when that environment changed that? I mean, or was it leading up to that? I know they you were, weren't there. They were, they were leading up. Like they had but done now a it's like the job. place to go. Oh, man. It, and, and then and that, and we couldn't even go out and eat. We couldn't walk around town. We yeah. couldn't, like, you'd go for dinner with your mom and dad before a game, and it was like, you know, you needed secret service. Like, we were like God there, right? And... Uh, to and see you're it. a country guy, aren't you? Oh, I love country. I was going to say, so. this is right in your wheelhouse. Yeah. Was sure. it like that when you were first there, though? I mean, I know it was, but yeah, it was not it, as much. It was like they, they always did a really good job connecting the musicians with the players. Yeah. And like we always had like Brooks and Dunn around, Vince Gill, like <laughs> Dirks Bentley, you know, all these like, like, you know, some Hall of Famers, but then some up and comers too. Yeah. Like with Dirks Bentley, like he was like, we were playing men's hockey in the summer. I did a him. Harley ride with him here. Yeah, he's just a great guy, right? So, um, you know, and then to, to see that leave on, you know, the teams going in a good direction and then coming back to that, like it was incredible. Yeah. Like they, yeah. they've done such a great job there and the, the, the culture with, you know, one GM, like, you know, three coaches yeah. or four coaches, yeah. whatever they're at. Same staff, like mm -hmm. people in the office are still all the same. Like, Do you believe change is good? 
Do you think, I mean, because they're, I mean, they didn't get off to a great start this year. So, but do you think they, do you think it needs to be changed? Do you think there need to be some, a new voice? I think Poyle's going to step down before he leaves. I mean, I don't think they're going to. Yeah, they would never. I mean, he'd him. probably step sideways or something but like yeah, that. Yeah, of course, but, change is good. I mean, you, you know, the, it's like the old, old saying, like it's the, 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 the your message that goes away, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's how the new NHL is now. I think it's like a three to four year span for these coaches to get yeah. fired. Like, and maybe not even that long. Yeah. So it's just one of those things where these poor coaches, like they move your family here, they move, you know, mm -hmm. they set up roots here and they're, it's just, they're, they're not going to last long. It's almost like the years. curse is when you buy a house. Yeah. You know, you're getting traded yeah. like within a year or two. Yeah. Um, so you, you mentioned coaching a couple of times. I know you went back to, was it Kelowna? Yeah. What'd you, what did you think about coaching? Do you want to get? Did would you ever want to get into it? Or was it? You well, got your taste at that. I was, I was level. doing player development and organization coach with the Stars here, and I got the opportunity uh, to go back to Cologne and and be on the bench. And um, I really wanted to try it and see because I I loved what I was doing in in with the Stars, and I was on the ice every day with the team. And then when they would go on the road, I'd go down to the minors and work with the young kids. I hated being in the press box. Yeah. So. Uh, my my owner, the owner from Kelowna, phoned me in the summer and said, "Hey, I know you're doing this coaching thing. Would you be interested in coming, you know, helping us out? We have Memorial Cup." And I said, "Well, yeah, I'll, you know, let me talk to my wife. We've been talking about moving back to Canada and just to be closer to family for a couple of years." And ended up going back, and <clears throat> I lo I liked it. I didn't love it. Um, I, I I I was missing hockey tournaments and. Um, you know, I was missing time where on a Sunday you're traveling to Moose Jaw or, you know, Prince George where you're mm -hmm. like, oh, I want to be on my couch and I, you know, I, I want to have a career, but I, I, I don't know if this is it. So I, I kept going. I thought I'll try it out for the year. Well, COVID hit and we, our season got canceled. We didn't even host the Memorial Cup. So then we were stuck in Canada. So I coached another 14 games. And I told the owner before the season started, I said, this will be my last. Yeah. Like, I'm going to go back to Dallas after this year. So, you know, this is my coaching career is going to be, you know, shortened. Uh, but, you know, I, I was I was on the fence. I, I liked it. I didn't love it. I, I don't want to miss my kids' events. And I, I don't want yeah. to be a dad that's, I've already missed enough with, with yeah. you know, playing for as long as I did. And, you know, I, it might be a different story if I didn't have kids, but I want to be a part of their their activities and help them develop and grow as as uh, people and and you know athletes. So I thought that you know we just come back here and I'd figure something else out. And and you are yeah. well, you have you've done both of those. So yeah, which leads us let, let's talk about not your your career now. Let's talk about your son Blake. Yeah, you're you're traveling when you can with with the U16 team. Is it difficult for you to be on the bench? And and your your son's a defenseman, good size. What six two, six three? Yeah, six almost six. He's three a big now. kid, yeah. uh, and he should he could be U fifteen yet, right? So yeah. is he playing up? Yeah, yeah, he's playing up a year. Describe your son. Uh, well, Blake's a good kid. He uh, he's got he, you know he's he's kind of the opposite of me. He's very laid back. He's uh, you know. You can be out there. For, yeah. You can be a social butterfly. <laughs> pretty quiet, uh, pretty quiet kid. But as far as uh, as hockey, he he's his passion for the game is is incredible. It's just like you know, there's times in the car on the way home from games and stuff that you're just like, man, just give me like five minutes to just like, you know, mm -hmm. not talk about hockey. He just constantly loves the game. He's constantly shooting pucks. He's constantly working at you know something with his game. Um, you know, we were, he was lucky enough to get drafted by the Edmonton Oil Kings and, uh, you know, start his path, mm -hmm. which I, I, I'm, I'm thrilled to be a part of. Um, as, as far as hockey, I try to stay on this side of the bench and let him kind of do his thing. And I notice you down by the defenseman. Are he, I, I mean, well, he's the, I'm, I'm on the forward. Yeah. I try to, like, I want to be his buddy. I want to be his do friend. You, do you kind of, if he comes off with a shift... <laughs> and you have something you would like to talk to him. Do you wait or do you walk around and whisper in his ear? No, I'll, I'll always wait and let him digest it. And then I'll, you know, he knows my looks too. Yeah. Like there's okay. a couple looks like, or like I'll whistle and he, he knows, knows he fucked something up. He knows like to get going. Okay. You know? Yeah. But, um, you know, I know for last year we had coach Bob Johnson running the D and, 
and I'd run the and I'd run the forwards, and I I think that worked out really good because he doesn't want to be listening. I don't think it's right. fair. Like that that's one rule we have. We don't talk about his his hockey and 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 break his game down in the car. We either talk about it before the rink, we leave the rink, or when we get home because mm-hmm. I don't feel it's I don't feel it's fair that those other kids just get to go home and not have yeah. to deal with me. Right. So I want him to be like, well, you're a coach. Let's deal with this at the rink. So we'll have a good chat after the rink before we get in the car. And then when we get in the car, then it's on to the stars and all that stuff. So you can but, separate his game when yeah. you're away from the rink. So and and you know what? With my parents, that's how they were. They never, they, they just blamed everything on the refs. It was, I never did a bad thing in my life, right? Do you ever, if you guys are watching a game together, whether it's at the Star Center or on TV, and it's a defenseman. Like if you're watching, you know, whoever Columbus played, do you ever kind of pause it and rewind it? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, oh, yeah. I, yeah. I do that like 24 seven. So yeah. not with my kids because they they don't listen to me anyways. But just with our players, I was just curious. Yeah, if you oh, do that. absolutely. We we're you know we go to games. We try to go to the games uh, during the week. Like if we can rip down and you know go for two periods or yeah. two and a half and then rip home. But and sit there and you know do this or how do you how are you going to get more active offensively or wh- how to box out or yeah. you know little things that it's I like, know a guy that can teach him all that. <laughs> well, I might need you. <laughs> um, just like little things like I know, for instance, the other night um, Miller was was wasn't battling a guy in front of the net super yep. hard right. until the puck went to the point, and then that's when he engaged. And, and Blake said, why, why is he doing that? I said, well, you know, he's saving his energy. Like, why box him out when you don't have to? Like, yeah. get him when, you know, you, you need yeah. your energy, right? So, you know, just little things like that. Like, I'm, I was a forward, but, you know, I try to watch But you it. know what you didn't like. Right. Like, I always look at it. At, you have a son that's a defenseman. You were a forward. And we, we're supposed to play against you in front of our own net. We're not necessarily supposed to be at the other end, although there are yeah. those kind of players now. And more coaches coach like that. But you can always tell them what I didn't like. Right. I hated it when a defenseman did this or when yeah. he stopped my progress here, yeah. or lifted my stick instead of like I, the, the, a pet peeve for me is when defensemen always come over the top of sticks because you, you can still tip a puck. Yeah. Like get it, get the stick up of the ice. But you yeah. can kind of look at it from from the opposite, right? Yeah. And, and coach in those ways. Okay. So we don't got to beat you up with your son. Let, let's we'll, we'll end it on this because you have a new career. How you're a realtor? You're a realtor to the stars, literally yeah. and figuratively. <laughs> How did you get into this? And what was the problem? We talked a little bit about the airport. You kind of fast, we didn't fast track it, but you did some yeah, serious so, studying. Um, you know, I came back and I didn't really have much to do during the day. And I was looking for, we bought a house, but we were looking kind of for a new, newer house that, you know, we liked a little bit better, but we needed to buy this other house for the school system. Mm. I'm like, well, we'll just, you know, the market was crazy. So I started going out with Jeff Cheney, who was the mayor of Frisco. And he also so has, it's, it's it's not always about what you know it's who you know yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. and he's a great guy. I've, I've known him for years with you know doing charity events and really solid guy. And you know we got chatting a little bit, and I said you know I I I'd send him houses, and he but man you got you you know you might you might have a career in real estate. And I I, I was just kind of joking around, you know. I said I thought about that, and he said to me he said you know I if if you're serious about that. When did you when you said you thought about it? How long ago did you think about it? Well, I, was this it, was like this was December. We had went home for okay. Christmas, and he. Followed. It's not something ten years ago you wanted to be a realtor. No, my okay. my mom and my grandma were realtors, but uh, I was I was with Jeff, and he said, well, you know, if you're serious about that, like. You know, we'll what's the name of the company you're with, by the way? Cheney Group Realty. It's, okay. it's part of Monument, but we have our own team. It's called the Cheney Group. Okay. Uh, so he, you know, we were on the phone, and you just said, you know, if you're serious about that, I'll hire you. But you got to, you know, you got to go get, the, the, you know, the test, and you got to do the school. And that was the biggest thing. I remember going home for Christmas, and I'm, you know, kind of chatting with my brother and my mom and my wife about it. And I said, you know, that I might do it, and you know, I, I wasn't really convinced I was going to do it because I hadn't taken a test since I was 18 years old. Right. I went and played pro at 20 and you start making a career out of that. Like yeah. we, we had stretch telling us where to be, what to eat. When Did you ever to read a sleep. book? Hey. Did you ever read a book? Not like I've read a book, but not like, you know, not, not for just for fun. Like, yeah. I mean, not, not like that I had to, like even in junior, you know how it is. Like we, oh, we, fuck. we get by, by, by the skin of our teeth. Yeah. Right? So I, I, I came back and I had nothing going on and I needed a challenge and I just, I went online and I signed up for the school and I, I was like 1200 bucks or 1300 bucks and I knew I'm, I'm cheap. So I knew the minute I pressed pay, <laughs> you I'm were, like, you were committed. Yeah, yeah. I'm doing it. Yeah. 
And I just started, I started, you know, grinding away at it. And uh, I found that going to the classroom really helped me. Like I, and I enjoyed it. Like I couldn't, I couldn't wait to get back there and go to school. And, and I mean, some, like most of the people don't even talk. But I was like there, I had notes, I had like, you know, my note, I was all organized, had highlighters, the whole, yeah. and I don't know what it was, and I, I think it was probably because we didn't spend a whole bunch of time at, at school when we were younger, but I just, I could, like when the class was over, I was like, oh, you know, so I, and I, some days I'd do two a days, like I'd go and do one course in the morning, one course at night, and I just grinded through it, and I, I think I wrote my test on Easter weekend, so what, was that April? Yeah. So started in January and I just I just grinded and grinded and um, I I read and re you're not supposed to write the national and state at the same time I read it I wrote it and passed them both and I couldn't believe it the guy said congratulations you passed and I said both yeah and I said you got to be kidding me because I thought I failed the the national for sure and you know it's just been guns ablaze and me and uh, you know Jeff uh, added me to his team of we got a great you know a great. Uh, mix of, of young and old and veteran guys and there's there's three three of us males and the rest females and you know they everyone kind of helps each other out so it's a lot like being in a dressing room I'll walk in and they'll chirp me about my outfits and yeah uh, you know stuff I do with contracts or whatever but um, we, we sold all that PGA development out there at the fields um, so is when you when you when you get your first deal, is it kind of like your first goal? Oh man, it's like there's no like it's a massive rush, but a lot of it's like, it, it, like you you gotta kind of expect the unexpected because like you'll have a deal done and then someone will back out of it and then uh -huh. something better will come. So there's highs and lows, just like oh, from man, shift to shift. And 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 you know I I give these people a lot of credit. I mean I have a nice nest egg where I'm not. There's not much pressure for me. Where mm -hmm. some of these people, like if you don't sell something that month, you know, or yeah. you know, in three months, like the pressure's on. So like you get a real good high and there's a big deal and then it falls apart. Yeah. Like I imagine like it's a massive crash, but yeah, like to be to be honest, when I got my first deal, like it's a massive rush. Like yeah. I remember getting in my truck and like it's once it's sealed. Especially I, when you get that paycheck. You're, yeah. You're, yeah, you're yeah. you're fist pumping. Yeah. So you know, I kinda I, I'm very lucky to be a part of the Cheney group because they don't hire uh, they they haven't they don't hire new people. And uh, to be in, the, in that mix of that caliber of, of, of real estate agents, I'm very lucky. Yeah. And you know, we've we've just just from word of mouth and friends and family. Like we, we, it, well, it definitely helps. You know, coming having a career like you did, and yeah. everybody knows a name. Yeah. So you know, it's I mean, been. Yeah, and it's funny. Like I'll that's got to open up I'll, doors. I'll phone some realtors and you know they show their places or whatever, and yeah. they'll be like. Have, have we have we done a deal together uh -huh. before? And I say no, I don't. You know, I'm I'm just new to real. I, I, I I've heard, I've seen that name somewhere, and I'm like, well, I used to play for. The, I knew it. You know, yeah. I played for the stars. And that time. helps, right? It, yeah, it, yeah. Well, it builds a con a little sure. bit of a connection and a yeah, relationship, and people and, are, yeah. you know, they're like they're more interested in the hockey than. Actually yeah. getting the deal. Well, do you have to? Do you have to do a lot of schmoozing parties or any of those? Yeah, kind of, yeah. I do. Like we do a lot of golfing, and you know, you got. Oh yeah, tough job. Yeah, you got to show. You up. and Turco we, are the same. Yeah, we got. We had a golf tournament yesterday at Stonebriar. That was fun. But yeah, just being in the community, and um, you know, during the week, it gives me like a purpose. And we yeah. have a meeting every Tuesday to go over all of our new listings and what we've sold, and it's it gives me a lot of flexibility to. To leave with my mm. son and it's going to give me a lot of flexibility when he leaves home next year to in Edmonton I'll be able to I can work from my computer yeah so um, you know I'll have to show my face a little bit obviously but it's not going to take 14 hour days out of my out of my days with like coaching there, and that but is there a uh, fiddler realty on the horizon no, anytime I don't know soon? if I'm going to get to that level I like just having someone else as my boss and yeah. being able to leave whenever I want and um, you know, at, and at the same time, make a little bit of money, and, mm -hmm. and also build a lot of relationships uh, socially and, and business-wise. And um, you know, I've always had uh, interest in investment properties and stuff like that done in the past, and uh, just look forward to continue to, to learn and educate myself. And yeah, well, Brendan Morrow's selling land for golf courses and stuff like that, right? Isn't he? Yeah, is he living in National? No, Where's no, he's in he's in uh, Austin. Oh, that's right. Living in Austin, yep. doing it the same thing. And it's just, it's all about being able to deal with people. And, yeah. you know, it's demanding. Like, a lot of people are like, oh, that's so easy. I'm like, 
when you get a deal, like there's tons of work that goes into computer work. You don't have people that do that for you? Yeah, we have we have a majority yeah. gets done by our office manager Dolly, but uh, a majority, like I mean, we have to do you know for like sending emails and making organizing different uh -huh. things with the with the option period and you know the terms of the deal. Like there's stuff that you. But but remember, us as players, more so myself than probably you, but. We had to be detailed in our game. Yeah. We weren't good enough to just yeah. let it go on talent. Yeah. Or we had to have the details in place. Yeah. Well, Fids, I appreciate you for being here today, and congratulations on your, your next career. Probably make you more money than, well, maybe <laughs> not. But I, I appreciate you being here, and I, I just think that when I, when I watched you play, you were that effective, efficient player that just had a role, knew what your role was, bought into it, and you'd come out of every game just to have done your job. And the kind of guy that you want to put a team together, you know, you're, you're that guy. So I appreciate you taking the time today. I know I, you probably got a big, couple big deals on your <laughs> phone right now that you got to follow up on. So again, Vern Fiddler, former Dallas star, now the big time realtor here in Dallas, Fort Worth. Um, thanks again for being here. Thanks for having me. Buddy. All right.